Do you need the mic? No. Does recording? Okay. Hi everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm Susan DeCostanza, if you haven't met me before. I'm a staff attorney here at Chicago Volunteer Legal Services, and I wanted to welcome you to our seminar today, for those of you who are here in person, as well as for those of you who are online. Um, we have Owen Daniel McCarter here, who is the legal director and staff attorney um, for the Trans Life Center at Chicago House. And so he's going to give you a little bit more about his background, but we're excited to have him here. Thanks for coming. Um, a couple of things before we get started. I just wanted to let you know that there are some other good seminars coming up. So next month on April 17th, we have um, a seminar on nursing homes, um, on residents' rights, on licensing requirements, on long-term care, on the long-term ter care ob ombudsman, and also kind of, if you're a GAL, on kind of interacting with that ombudsman. So that should be a good lunchtime seminar on April 17th. As always, you can sign up online on our website. And then in May, and moving forward, we have a series of lunchtime seminars on uh, foreclosure defense and kind of some of the updating you on some of the ways that foreclosure expense has changed over the recent years. Um, so those should be good as well. Have a look and please join us for those. Um, if you have questions here in the room, I'm going to ask, um, our speaker will let you know how to ask questions, but if you have a question here, I'm going to have to repeat it into the microphone so that it can be recorded and that those online viewers can watch it as well. So that's just a heads up. If you say it, I'm going to repeat it for you. Um, and if you could wait and be patient for that, that would be great. And then the only other thing is that at the end we'll have evaluations for you to fill out, and we'll kind of we'll put those on um, on the desk on your way out. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. Um, thank you to CVLS for having me. I feel like I should speak into this mic, but it's fine, right? I can I can keep a distance. Okay. No headset. No Madonna. On the mission tour. Bummer. Um, so my name is Owen. I am um, the staff. Uh, attorney and legal director at the Trans Life Center. Um, and I guess I'll just give a little tiny bit of background information about myself, um, and then we'll get right into uh, today's program, which we'll spend the first uh, third of it going over some trans language, basic respect and etiquette tips um, for legal practitioners and advocates. Um, then we'll talk about some systemic barriers that we see for transgender people and how those interact with different areas of law. And then I'll delve into a few key areas of law where there's been a lot of change in policy recently um, specific to transgender people and um, the trans community. So that's what we'll do. Well, there'll be time for question and answer at the end, but if there's a question that you have for folks who are live in the audience right now, um, feel free to raise your hand and ask if need clarification on something. Um, so I began practicing in Illinois in 2011. Um, I am the co-founder of the Transformative Justice Law Project of Illinois, which is a legal organization that works with transgender people who are incarcerated throughout the state. Um, I'll get into this more as I move further in the CLE, but there's a very high number of transgender people, particularly transgender women, who are in the criminal legal system, and there's a lot of systemic reasons for that. But for the most part, transgender people are placed according to the sex that was assigned to us at birth. So most of my clients are transgender women who are in men's facilities, and there's a whole bunch of legal issues that come about um, from personal safety, um, sexual autonomy, to access to medicine, trans-specific health care, and also placement inside of the facility. So that's what we do at the Transformative Justice Law Project. Um, I just started in July of last year at the Trans Life Center, which is a project of Chicago House and Social Service Agency. Um, and I should also mention that I am also a transgender person myself. Um, I, I like to self-disclose, just to put context to some of my own personal investment in this issue. Um, so anyway, there's that. Um, but uh, Chicago House and Social Service Agency was founded in 1985 um, as a response to the AIDS epidemic. Um, it was a, um, a movement um, to help people who were being denied housing, kicked out of housing, denied access to hospitals when they were diagnosed with HIV to provide a place for people to die with dignity. So we actually own property since 1985 in Chicago um, where people could basically have really affirming hospice care in their last few months or years of life. Um, we've transitioned our program significantly as the AIDS crisis has changed um, over the past few decades. 
Now we work primarily with people who are formerly incarcerated, who have experienced homelessness, um, who are gender non-conforming or in the LGBT community, um, and or who are impacted by HIV and AIDS. We provide housing, we're a housing first model, which is a radical and beautiful idea that people will be healthier um, if they have housing. <laughs> wow. Um, so we provide housing. We have five different actual units, um, property that we own, um, and we also do scattered site housing um, for people who are living with HIV and or who are gender non-conforming. Um, we provide wraparound services, which means that we provide employment advocacy, we connect people into healthcare, we have case management, mental health services, um, and a new part of our program is the Trans Life Center, um, which is specific to transgender people. Transgender people have a very high rate of incarceration, as I already mentioned. We also see, particularly for transgender women of color, incredibly high rates of HIV transmission still, rates that are as high, if not higher, than they were in 1985. Um, it's definitely a population that has been ignored largely by federal research um, and has some pretty specific requirements as far as access to health care and other barriers that kind of contraindicate with being transgender in receiving medical services that are affirming. So we see a lot of people um, living with HIV who are transgender women. So the Trans Life Center is um, in part an attempt to decrease that and to provide a national model. We are being studied by the Health Resource Service Administration at the federal level um, as a possible model to use in other places, which is a housing first model for trans people who are um, experiencing homelessness or incarceration um, and impacted by HIV. Um, we also provide um, a, a works program, an employment program that's specific to transgender people. I am the director of the legal program. I have a staff of one, which is me. <laughs> so I direct myself, which is quite a task. Um, but so far, it's going OK. Um, I might ask for a raise soon. Um, just kidding. Um, so <laughs> I provide legal services because there are so many legal issues that are specific to transgender people. Um, there's complications, for example, in the success of our housing program or employment program because of someone's involvement in the criminal legal system, um, because of someone's um, ability or inability to access things like identity documents that reflect who they are um, when they are going through that process. So um, I'm helping with all of that. It's very new for Chicago House to have a legal component to our mission, but I think it makes a ton of sense. Um, and so uh, it's an exciting, it's an exciting time. We actually have the original building that was our origin original hospice care, which is the Trans Life Center. It's a nine unit mansion in Edgewater. Um, it's beautiful. We have an amazing kitchen that was donated by the Merchandise Mart that's you know, worth more than most of our homes, I'm sure. Um, and it's just a really, really spectacular place for people who are formerly homeless and transgender to live. Okay, so today um, I'm hoping that I can introduce some terminology and basic definitions to help with trans advocacy, um, address some of the legal issues that we see and some best practices that we can have as attorneys and legal advocates for um, counteracting some of those legal issues. And I also just want to highlight the resiliency and some of the challenges that transgender people face. <sighs> okay. <laughs> So the first part of our training is just a very brief transgender 101, so we can have some common language as I delve into the legal issues. Um, and on the screen, for those who can't see it, is the gender binary, um, which is the expectation in our culture, in dominant US culture, that there are men and women, and that men and women necessarily have specific types of sex characteristics. Um, and a bunch of performances that we expect from an infant from the time of birth based on pretty much their genitalia alone, right? And this is when we start gendering our children. We expect them to play with Batman instead of Barbie or vice versa. We give them gendered clothing, gendered toys. We um, can anticipate what type of career they might go into, um, what type of sexual orientation they will have based solely on gender norms in our society, right? The reality is that none of us live up to gender norms, right? We all change our genders. We all have different genders at different times of the day even, right? We might express our genders differently when we're in court versus when we're at home on a Sunday relaxing in front of the television or with a book, right? Um, we change our performance, our expression of our gender identities um, throughout our lives. 
And we also will change expression based on where we live, what cultural background we have, our racial identity, our age, right? If we ask our grandparents who is the perfect woman, we'll get a really different answer than we, if we ask our young niece or nephew who is the perfect woman or perfect man, right? It's a cultural norm. It is a social construction. We give gender meaning in our society, right? Um, okay. <laughs> Um, so there's four key terms that we want to separate when we're thinking about transgender people. We want to think about gender identity, which is how we think about our genders in our heads, right? Gender expression, which is how we express what our identity is on the outside. So that could be long hair, that could be makeup, that could be nails, that could be suit and tie, that could be dress, right? There's a lot of different ways we express to the world what we want to be treated as and how we identify as far as our gender identity. Then we have biological sex, which is different than gender. When I say biological sex, I mean our actual sex characteristics. Chromosomes, genitalia, hormones, secondary sex characteristics, facial hair, male pattern balding, vo the sound of our voice, hips, breasts, these are all secondary sex characteristics. It's different than our gender performance, right? And then sexual orientation, which often gets confused with transgender people because we hear the term LGBT all the time, or GLBT, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender. Um, there's a reason why we lump these groups together because there's often discrimination and bias, social issues that are connected to gender expression, right? Somebody might be targeted as being gay because they are a man who's effeminate, right? That's about gender expression and gender presentation. Um, or who is a woman who is very masculine in appearance, right? That could be a signifier to society that person is gay or lesbian, um, but they're not the same. Transgender people, just like non-transgender people can be gay, lesbian, bisexual, queer, questioning, asexual, pansexual, etc. right? We have um, sexual orientations as well. Um, what really trips people up is thinking about a sexual orientation about being attracted to certain types of sexes, right, bodies, or is it being attracted to certain types of gender identities, right? Like I'm attracted to masculinity or I'm attracted to femininity. And transgender people really um, cause us to ask those questions, which is lovely. Um, so a trans person is someone whose sex gender identity differs from that sex that was assigned to us at birth, right, based on our, our genitalia. Um, and you'll hear some terms with trans people, such as transition, which could be a period of time when someone is making a transition from one gender identity to another. For some trans people, transition lasts their entire lives. It's a life process. For some people, there's a very clear beginning and end date for their gender transition process. And I'll, I'll very briefly kind of outline some transition options that people might pursue. Now, in 2014, you will very frequently hear just the term trans, um, instead of transgender, transsexual, all different types of terms we've heard in the past, just to refer to an overarching community of people whose gender expression differs from what was expected of them at the time of their birth, right? So who are these fantastic trans people that I speak of? Um, we can think of a lot of different identities as falling under what I call the transgender umbrella. So if you can think about an umbrella term being trans or transgender, and you can think about a lot of different identities falling under that umbrella, this is what I'm talking about when I say the trans umbrella. One of the probably most commonly known um, identities is the identity of transsexual, as someone who is changing aspects of their sex characteristics. And remember, Sex characteristics are a lot of things, chromosomes, hormones, secondary sex characteristics, genitalia, right? Um, we commonly hear this misnomer of a sex change operation or the operation or sex reassignment surgery as though there was one very special surgery that overnight changes us from Batman into Barbie, right? And tragically, there is no such magical surgery that does this overnight. Right? There's a lot of different sex changing options that people might pursue. Not one type of surgery and not surgeries alone. For example, if someone were to take hormone therapy, um, someone who let's say was assigned male at birth who takes estrogen and an androgen blocker to stop testosterone production in the body, that person will have very feminizing effects to their body like a second puberty almost, if they went through the first one, depending on when they start their hormones, right? 
So that person will develop softer skin, they may develop breasts, they will have a decrease in the growth of facial hair, or other types of hair on the body, right? A feminizing effect just from the introduction of hormones alone. Similarly, someone who's assigned masculine at birth, right? Someone who, or excuse me, someone who's assigned female at birth who takes testosterone is going to go through a male appearing puberty when they start taking testosterone. Their ovaries will atrophy. They will no longer produce estrogen at the levels they did before. They will grow facial hair. They will have a lower voice. They will um, produce more muscle in their body than they did before, right? This person might appear to be male just based on hormone therapy alone. No surgeries whatsoever, right? And this is a sex changing procedure. So that person might identify as a transsexual. Some people will pursue surgical options, and this is what we hear a lot about. This is what the law thinks a lot about because the law lends on dominant medical ideas about who trans people are in order to validify what our sexes and genders are when they matter, like in family law and our identity documents, et cetera. Um, Say that part again. Um, the law. The law relies on dominant medical notions of who is transgender when somebody has transitioned their sex specifically to um, look to when we can change our gender markers legally, right? And when they're significant, like we have a lot of marriage cases questioning whether or not a marriage is valid in states that do not have same-sex marriage um, with the issue of someone who's changed their sex, right, and has had maybe all of their legal documents changed to female, has married a non-trans man, and the question becomes when someone dies intestate or when we have a medical malpractice challenge, wrongful death case, right, about the standing of that person, whether or not their marriage is valid based on the, the sex change. And we really see the courts looking to what medical providers determine is in a completed sex change, right? So we have a bunch of different types of surgeries. Um, there's not just one. Um, and there's not just one type of genital surgery, which is usually what we think of when we think of a sex change operation. There's a lot of different types. People will have surgeries on their faces, on their Adam's apples, on their chests, on their hips. People will add and remove hair from their bodies, right? We see a lot of different types of surgeries in trans communities. You should know that these surgeries are largely excluded from health insurance coverage. I, I challenge you, if you are insured, to look at your health insurance policy. I will um, bet money with you today that there is an explicit line in your policy that excludes transition-related health care, treatment for transsexualism, something of that nature. I know it. my Blue Cross Blue Shield explicitly excludes it. Our state Medicaid statute also explicitly excludes treatment for transsexualism, which means that for people who want these surgeries, and not all trans people want surgeries, but for people who want these surgeries, it can be very hard to actually get them because they're quite expensive, they're not covered by health insurance, they're not covered by public Medicaid and Medicare policies, um, and so people are often paying out of pocket. And by quite expensive, I mean to the tune of you know, $17,000 to $35,000, depending on what type of surgery you want. Um, okay, so um, another term that you'll hear under the, gen the transgender umbrella is the term gender identity disorder or gender dysphoria. Some of the cases that I um, provided in the CLE materials today make reference to these two terms. These are actual mental health diagnoses from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Gender identity disorder comes from the DSM-3 and 4, um, and gender dysphoria is from the DSM-5, which was just recently released a few months ago. Um, this is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual by the American Psychological Association. So it is, in fact, considered a mental disorder to be transgender, which was added into the DSM in 1980, right after homosexuality was removed from the DSM as a mental disorder, which it was. Um, so you'll hear these two terms a lot. Most trans people really reject the idea that being transgender is a mental disorder. Um, we feel like this is transphobia on the part of the Psychological Association. Um, and yet, it is one of the ways that we get courts to legitimize our existence as trans people. So one of the cases I included in the CLE materials is the Fields versus Smith case that is a very recent 2011 Seventh Circuit decision that found that Wisconsin transgender prisoners had the right to hormone treatment as treatment for gender identity disorder, which um, under the Eighth Amendment, the court determined was a serious medical need. 
that required treatment, right? Um, so we have this, you know, kind of uh, validity, right, um, or legitimizing of trans experience through the lens of a psychological disorder. So we have a lot of case law. We've established a lot of precedent that actually holds up this disorder as being a real thing <laughs> in our community. Some very savvy trans people have tried to use this disorder using um, disability law. Um, and so we therefore, as people who have a mental disability, require accommodations for that disability. Um, unfortunately, being transgender is also written out of the American Disabilities Act. Um, but some state disability protections do cover transgender people, like the New York State Disability Law, for example. Another term that you'll hear under the transgender umbrella is um, the term cross-dresser or transvestite, you might have heard. Transvestite is not a term that transgender people often use in community. It's also in the DSM. Um, it's called transvestite fetishism, which is another mental disorder. Um, but the more preferred term is the term cross-dresser. So this might be someone who is performing another gender, um, maybe for pageantry, maybe on the weekends in competitions. RuPaul's Drag Race is a great example of what we mean by cross-dressing. People who might identify with the sex assigned to them at birth, but perform the other gender occasionally. Um, someone who's a cross-dresser will have very different experiences at work with their medical provider in obtaining identity documents that reflect who they are than someone who is actually transitioning their gender identity to a different gender full time or is changing aspects of their sex characteristics full time. That's gonna impact their job, their housing, everything else, right? So they fall under this umbrella because we're changing our performance of our gender identities, but they have very, very different experiences. And if we add a racial lens, if we add class lens to that, we can see the experiences really vary amongst different um, trans people in this community. Another term that you'll hear um, under the transgender umbrella is the term gender queer or gender nonconforming. This is someone who maybe doesn't identify with that strict binary, that pink and blue, those pink and blue babies that we saw at the beginning. Um, someone who identifies as another gender. This might sound like a really hard concept for us to wrap our head around, especially as legal providers um, who are really kind of ingrained in the concept of male and female as being the only options for sexes and gender performances. Um, but actually there are many cultures who have more than one type of gender identity. Um, it's a fairly new um, concept to just have strictly two genders. Um, even here, traditionally, indigenous people um, and different tribes had many different gender identities in what is now the United States um, before, um, before they were colonized. Um, there's some terms that are very negative you should just avoid or interrupt if you hear them, like he, she, she, male, tranny. These are terms that are really used with a lot of hatred behind them um, and are terms that are connected to a lot of violence and sexualization of transgender people, particularly. Okay. So I can answer more questions about that. I know that was a lot. Um, I'm hoping that some of the materials you have um, particularly the Transgender 101 um, five-page handout, which has additional resources at the end, websites, books you can check out, et cetera, will be a great opportunity for you to explore more about these identities if you aren't already familiar with them. Um, so this is a funny little, ooh, and I'm already running behind. Um, this is a funny little diagram just to summarize what we mean when we say gender identity, expression, sex, and sexual orientation. Again, the gender-bred person's identity is in the brain, right? Um, their expression is on their body, their orientation is who they love, who they're attracted to, and their sex here, unfortunately, it's focused on the genital region, but sex is chromosomes, hormones, genitalia, secondary sex characteristics. Um, Okay, one more thing I wanna add before switching more into the advocacy, best practices, and law section of the training is just the term cis, which is receiving a lot of popularity these days. Cis is a term that's derived from um, Latin and from chemistry, actually. Cis, which means on the same side as. You'll hear cis being used to refer to people who are not transgender, right? Someone who's for example, using this slide, right? Someone who was assigned male at birth identifies with 
uh, masculinity and has a masculine gender expression. That would be a cisgendered person. Right? And the reason why this term is gaining popularity is it takes some of the attention off of trans people, right? that we have men and women, we have trans men and trans women. Instead, we can kind of uh, assert that all people make decisions about our gender identities, not just trans people. Right? And some people decide that they feel comfortable with the gender that was assigned to them at birth. Right? They feel comfortable on the same side as what was ex expected of them. Um, so we can think about cisgendered people as being non-trans people, transgender people as being trans people. Okay, so um, some very brief action steps um, to create a culture of inclusion as advocates. Um, <coughs> this is what we can do and don't do. We can add gender identity protections to our, our agency or firm's discrimination policy. We can make sure that we have referral lists, we have resources around trans services, understanding that there are specific needs, medical needs, legal needs, um, housing needs, employment advocacy needs that a trans person might need. Having those materials available can show a trans person that you are a great ally. Um, hiring trans people, we're everywhere, right? We're lawyers, we're judges, um, we're paralegals. Um, we're not just clients, right? So making sure that you include transgender people in the workplace is important. Creating welcoming waiting rooms, meeting rooms, etc. cetera. Um, there's a lot of tips on how to do that I can get into more later. Understanding how systems are connected to one another, which I'll get into in the next slide. Um, understanding how transphobia is really something that's pervasive, that's in a variety of institutions, not just our legal institutions. And understanding how kind of upsetting, humiliating, dehumanizing that can be for a trans person. Um, and thinking about ways that you can um, get to know the community, update your forms, etc., to kind of counteract some of that. Um, having a training for your staff is an excellent way to also counteract transphobia. Thinking about trans-inclusive health insurance, um, if you do work for an agency or a firm that provides health insurance. Thinking about bathroom accessibility, gender-neutral bathrooms or bathrooms that are open to all different types of gender expressions. Um, and interrupting transphobia in court and in your theory of the case, which I'll get into <coughs> more. Um, ignoring someone's trans identity, and I mostly do criminal defense work, identity document work, criminal record sealing, is always tied into the case, right? Always. And not understanding that is really doing your client a disservice, um, to not understand the nuances of how transphobia impacts their legal situation. Okay, I'm going to skip through this because you have these printed materials and I'm already running behind. Um, but um, these are some do's and don'ts, some things to make note of. Um, two things that I will highlight as I skip through is just to try very hard to affirm someone's gender identity. Um, particularly someone who might be low income, who doesn't have access to gender affirming health care. That person might have different access to what we in trans community call passing. You might hear this um, term. So passing as your gender identity. For example, I'm often told that I pass as a man. Right? I was assigned female at birth. All of my identity documents still say female. But I'm often told that I pass as a man. That's what we mean in trans community by passing. Passing as a non-transgender person. Passing will afford a transgender person a lot of safety. Right? L not being ridiculed every time you're on the train, not being asked if you're in the right place when you try to use the bathroom, um, actual real problems of physical <coughs> violence, sexual violence that we see against transgender people. Um, passing protects people from that. And often trans people will want to pass. That's one of their goals, is to just be seen as their gender identity. So particularly for folks who don't have access to medical resources that might aid them in passing, it can be very important for an advocate to affirm their gender identity. Right? Be sure that you're using someone's preferred pronouns. He and she are popular examples when you're talking about someone. You can ask your client, how do you like to be referred to? Right? What pronoun should I use for you when I'm in court? What pronoun would you like me to use for you when I'm filing this uh, petition for partial custody on your behalf? Right? Um, is there anything I can do to help that process, to make it a little more comfortable for you? These are great questions to ask a client. Um, and also, if someone hasn't had their legal name changed, it can be great to have a preferred name process. I know, as attorneys, it's often really necessary to know someone's legal name with the exact correct spelling um, in certain types of cases particularly. Um, but that doesn't mean that you need to refer to that person by that name when you're having a one-on-one -on -one meeting with them, when you're calling them to schedule an appointment. 
right? Um, and so asking someone what their preferred name is can be another great way to show someone that you're a trans ally. Okay, so the need. Why do we see so many transgender people in the criminal legal system? Why do we see so many transgender people with higher rates of HIV transmission? Why do we see so many transgender people living in poverty? And particularly for free legal services, right, you're gonna see a lot of transgender people as soon as you make your programming trans accessible, right? If when trans people know that they will be affirmed in a space, you bet your bottom dollar trans people have a lot of legal issues that they will need help with, right? Um, so why? Um, we know that transgender people are uh, disproportionately likely to experience violence at home, in the street, in healthcare settings, um, that transgender people are four times as likely as non-trans people to be living in poverty, four times as likely. We know that transgender people are more likely to have been arrested or incarcerated, particularly black and Latina trans people, particularly transgender women who are black and Latina. So there's a lot of racial, racializing and gendered questions to consider when we talk about criminalization. Um, in fact, the research study that's on the next slide in your packet, um, should be on the next slide in your packet, Injustice at Every Turn, that research study found that 54% of black trans people have been incarcerated at some point in their lives. 54%. Um, that's huge, <laughs> right? That's more than half. Um, so it's certainly a problem. It's certainly something we need to consider as advocates. Um, we see a high rate of suicide ideation um, and suicide attempts. 41% of trans people have attempted suicide at some point in their lives. Um, and we see higher rates of HIV transmission, right? Nine times the rate for transgender women of non-transgender women. So the question is why? I like to really think systemically. I think as, particularly as attorneys who are working with poor people, we have to think systemically um, about how, how poverty happens and how it impacts someone's um, access to different institutions. Um, you have a a synopsis of the Injustice at Every Turn report in your materials. The full report is available online through um, the National Center for Transgender Equality website. I encourage you to read it over. Um, it's the first national study of its kind of trans people's experiences with different institutions. What we see is that transgender people have a harder time accessing um, employment, a har harder time with education, staying in school, staying in high school. Many trans people report being <coughs> bullied, um, phys real problems of physical violence. People who have been kicked out of gym class because they don't feel comfortable changing in the locker room that's uh, assigned with their sex. Um, people who live in jurisdictions that outright do not have any discrimination protections at all in any of these institutions which is still almost a third of people living in the United States have no protections for gender identity-based discrimination. Fortunately, in Illinois, we have protection at the Illinois state level in the Human Rights Act. Um, we have protection in Cook County in the Cook County Human Rights Ordinance and in the Chicago um, Human Rights Ordinance. So we are just one of the most protected um, jurisdictions in the country as far as transgender discrimination. Does that mean it doesn't happen? No. <laughs> Discrimination laws have not entirely solved the problem of discrimination, and we know that as practitioners. Um, but it is certainly a step in the right direction for um, people to have more protection here. We know that access to medicine is harder. Um, many transgender people report being flat out denied health care, even non transgender specific health care, like hormones, surgical care, that type of thing. But just imagine a transgender man, someone who's assigned female at birth, who identifies as a man, appears as a man, going to get gynecological care, right? And the experience of that, the experience of practitioners who have never seen a trans man before, right? We hear of people literally being kicked out of services, um, denied flat out, or health insurance companies denying treatment that is medically necessary because someone is transgender. Um, so we hear a lot of reports of people who are assigned male at birth, but who identify as women who are denied prostate exams or treat treatment for prostate cancer because their gender markers say female and our health insurance systems do not cover prostate exams for females. Go figure. Um, so trans people are here, we exist, we have complicated bodies for these systems because the systems do not presume that transgender people exist, right? Um, we hear about people being, you know, denied access to um, social safety nets like drug treatment programs, homeless shelters, um, foster care, juvenile um, group homes, right? 
um, because those facilities are often sex segregated and they often deny someone's gender identity. So they're going to place someone according to the sex assigned to them at birth, not how they identify. Um, which is either very unsafe for the trans person so they leave or they might actually be kicked out because they're considered a disturbance to the others for insisting on wearing feminine clothing in a men's space. Um, because of all those systems, right, working together, we see that transgender people are pushed into poverty. Um, so it's much harder to get a job when you don't have access to health care. It's hard to get health care when you don't have a job. It's hard to have um, housing when you don't have a job. It's hard to stay in school when you don't have housing, right? These are all connected. That's what we mean by a system problem. Um, and so we see a lot of people pushed into poverty. Because a lot of people are pushed into poverty, we see higher levels of what we call survival crime. Right? So I'm talking about low-level misdemeanor, primarily criminal activity, loitering, retail theft, um, trespass, prostitution, low-level possession of marijuana, for example, as being types of survival crime that we see very frequently with poor people. Of course, crimes like prostitution and retail theft can become felonies, class four felonies, after your first conviction in Illinois. Um, so we actually see it quite easily spiraling into prison time, right, or felony time, just because of low-level survival crime. We also see a high level of transgender people who might plead guilty, even if they have not actually engaged in the type of criminal activity, right, that, um, it, that they're being charged with. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One might be that they're placed in jail, in a jail facility that does not correspond with their gender identity, right? And if they're presented with a plea deal, which is you get out on time served today, or you could spend another mm -hmm. few weeks, month, two months, three months waiting in Cook County Jail in a men's facility as a transgender woman without access to your medical care that you need, without access to your support systems. A lot of people might take that deal just so they can get out of jail or prison, right? Um, we also see a lot of societal isms that play a role in how a trans person is perceived. Um, and what I mean by that is that many transgender women, particularly, are stigmatized or perceived as being in the sex trade, as engaging in prostitution, or as being sex workers. Something that we call walking while trans <laughs> in trans community, which is similar to the idea of racial profiling, driving while black, right? Um, this idea that a transgender woman who is not passing, right, who is perceived as a transgender person, is assumed to be engaged in prostitution. This is such a reality that the Chicago Police General Order that just came out explicitly says that Chicago law enforcement officers cannot use someone's transgender identity as reasonable suspicion that they're engaging in prostitution, right? Our policy actually says that to try and counteract the reality that this happens very frequently. And what happens if you imagine, right, a trial process for those few trials that actually happen, right? If you imagine a trial process, here you have a transgender woman, um, maybe in front of a jury, right, who's largely in a prostitution case. It's her word against police officers. And we have a whole jury box that has also been taught that this is what a prostitute looks like, right? Um, there's just a lot to combat there as far as an advocate, right, as an attorney. And also, most trans people, they know that the odds are stacked against them, right? So they might take that plea based on that alone. The other reality is that they might actually be engaged in the crime, right? We call it survival crime for a reason. <laughs> um, and when people need uh, access to, you know, housing um, and other types of monetary or um, medical uh, procedures that are not covered, that they can't have access to without money, they may engage in survival crime to make those things happen. So we see discrimination in housing, et cetera. We see the issue of identity documents, which I'll get into in more detail in a moment, criminalization, limited access to benefits, um, issues of legal recognition of gender identity, and violence. So I wanted to flag this for you. Um, it's in your materials. I hope you read it. A case called um, City of Chicago versus Kim Kimberly and Wallace Wilson. Um, trans people always have such fun names. <laughs> um, but this is a case, this is an Illinois Supreme Court case from 1978 that struck down our city of Chicago municipal ordinance that criminalized cross-dressing. Um, and so there's a whole other CLE I could give on the history of the criminalization of cross-dressing. It shouldn't be a shock to us that there's a large number of transgender people who are incarcerated. We literally have a history in this country of criminalizing 
gender nonconformity. Um, this is the actual stat, uh, municipal ordinance as it read in Chicago, any person who shall appear in a public place and address not belonging to his or her sex with intent to conceal his or her sex shall be fined not less than $20, not more than $500. These two petitioners were transgender women, not petitioners, appellants, um, defendants actually in the criminal case. They appealed on the basis of uh, constitutional challenge, due process and equal protection clause um, that this statute infringed on their, pre predominantly their liberty interests um, and also their treatment for transsexualism, for that gender identity disorder, which didn't exist yet, but it was treatment for transsexualism, and they won. So the Illinois Supreme Court found that as applied to transgender people, this statute is unconstitutional. Many other jurisdictions have criminal codes that criminalize gender nonconformity, and we are one of them. Um, okay. Um, a very brief overview of some legal issues, right? We're seeing a big sweeping change to the issue of health care, health care coverage. Um, the Affordable Care Act, Section um, 1557, has a non-discrimination clause that says that insurance providers um, cannot discriminate in treatment um, on the basis of any protected uh, discrimination in Title VII, Title IX, Title XI, which the Office of Civil Rights has interpreted to include transgender people. We have kind of shaky case law on that, actually. I would say we have bad case law on that, especially in the Seventh Circuit. Um, but the Office of Civil Rights has interpreted that it should include transgender people. With a new executive administration, we'll see if that interpretation stands. Um, but what that means is that a trans person could not be denied health care that's provided to someone else. So the example of the OBGYN care or prostate exam, if that's being provided to any person, you cannot be denied that type of care under the ACA solely because you're transgender. We see a ton of issues in family law that really attach to whether or not someone's gender identity is recognized legally. Um, and so I mentioned some of the marriage cases. Those are involving child custody. Um, they're involving um, intestacy laws. Um, one of the cases that I provided in the CLE materials, um, in remarriage of Simmons, that's an Illinois appellate court case from 2005 where a transgender man's uh, male identity was denied, his marriage was invalidated, he became a legal stranger to his child who he had adopted through the Illinois Artificial Insemination Act, contingent on his marriage being valid to his spouse. So when the court invalidated his marriage, he became literally a legal stranger to his child. Um, that's still good case law, and it's a law that really, uh, it's a decision that really shows us um, some of the fear, I think, on the part of the of lawmakers, ju both judges and the legislature alike, in blurring the lines of what it means to be male and female, right? So as we approach same-sex marriage, we're gonna find that issues of whether or not someone is male or female for the purpose of marriage in Illinois will matter less, but I think this case still resonates as far as how we're identifying what someone's legal gender is. And I'm gonna get into that in a little bit more detail. Um, Discrimination, again, there's a discrimination chart in your CLE materials that outlines the municipal ordinances, the Illinois Human Rights Act, and um, of course, Title VII. Um, Title VII, again, we have very shaky case law on this. The Seventh Circuit in a case, Ulane versus Eastern Airlines, uh, held verbatim that transgender people are not included under the term sex. It was not in intended to include transsexuals. Um, so we have bad case law, but we have the EEOC enforcing, currently enforcing um, Title VII as though it does include transgender discrimination. Again, prisoners' rights, there's more materials in your CLE on that, and I've included a copy of that Fields decision that I referenced earlier, the Wisconsin case, um, stemming from the Wisconsin Inmate Sex Change Prevention Act, um, which was found unconstitutional. You, it'll be a, interesting for you to read that, I'm sure. And then in the immigration context, we have kind of two areas of immigration law that we see a lot of trans movement in. One is the issue of asylum. And since 1999, we have actually included transgender people as a um, protected um, a protected identity on the basis of persecution for asylum law. The actual case is called INN, INS, back when we had the INS, versus Hernandez Montiel. I did not include it, unfortunately, but you can look it up. Um, and the category is a gay man with female sexual um, identity, which I've never heard a trans person identify that way, but that's what we have as far as what we need to show for asylum purposes. 
We also see some questions about family-based petitions. Um, again, this comes back to what someone's legal gender is and whether or not their marriage is recognized um, by the federal government for the purposes of family-based preference. Um, what we see is that for marriages that happen in the United States, deference is going to be given to the state that issues birth certificate um, and the state that issued the marriage license about whether or not that is a valid marriage. So the federal government has really deferred to the states. Of course, this is changing as the Defense of Marriage Act is being chipped away at, um, and it's still an area of law that's developing. There's some great cases on that, though. One is um, Enri Lovo Lara, if you're interested in the issue. Okay. So very briefly, um, I'm just going to run through a couple of areas of law that could be helpful for you if you're working with transgender people. One of the biggest ones is the name change. People who are transgender often want to change their legal names, particularly if their first name is a highly gendered name, like David or Mary, <laughs> right? These are names that it's going to make it hard for someone to get employment, housing, et cetera, and have their gender identity be respected um, if they have highly gendered given names. Um, so the name change process in Illinois is fairly simple. This is Cook County specific, what's on the screen right now. I don't know if people are in other counties, but you should check with your clerk um, because there are some nuances to how the procedure works in different counties. Um, but here, the, the statute, which I've also included in your materials, um, requires six months of residency in the state of Illinois. You have to be 18 or older to petition on your own. Um, but you can petition either with parental consent or if the parents are not consenting, there is a best interest of the child analysis um, for people who are under 18, um, which is spelled out in the statute. Um, the, probably the biggest barrier for the clients that I work with is the criminal bar. So you can see from the statute that there is a 10-year bar for any felony um, to change your name in the state of Illinois. And that 10 years starts ticking from the date of the termination of your disposition. So when your probation or parole ends, you have to wait 10 years from that date to change your name in Illinois. Unless you've been convicted of something that requires registry on the sex offender registry or an identity theft crime, and then you can never change your name in Illinois. It is a permanent, absolute permanent bar. Um, so remember, I was just talking about criminalization, right, and how charges like prostitution, retail theft can very quickly become felonies if you um, are convicted of more than one in the state of Illinois. So this is a huge barrier for transgender people. It's actually something that I'm in the process of figuring out how to challenge. If you're interested in talking with me more about that offline, I would love to chat with you about some of my ideas um, for how we can challenge a statute. Um, it's, there's some clear constitutional issues, I think, one of which is that you can change your name through marriage with no felony bar, but you can't change your name on your own, right? Equal protection. Um, and there's also a fairly um, intriguing issue, which is that you can change your gender marker, which I'll talk about in a second, without any of these felony restrictions. So any kind of argument about you know, ease in detecting criminals, making sure that um, we have accurate data, it doesn't really match up with some other very kind of profound things that you can change about your um, identity documents, regardless of your name. And this is pretty unusual in as far as states go. In other states, New York, you can change your name while you're incarcerated. Wisconsin has a sex offense um, bar, but no other type of bar. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty strict as far as state statutes go, the criminal restriction. Um, once you have that court order name change, you can bring that. The burden is on you as the petitioner to tell every single agency, Social Security, DMV, et cetera, that you've changed your name. Um, but it is a legally enforceable document, um, the court order. The gender marker change is a whole nother can of worms. Um, this <laughs> very small print chart explains that there are kind of two main types of gender marker change. In Illinois, this is not a court process at all. It's entirely administrative. Um, and the two main uh, markers for a gender change are a surgical standard and a non-surgical standard. So the surgical standard that we have in Illinois is the Illinois Vital Records Act, which I've also included in your materials. You'll see that subsection D requires, quote, an operation in order to change one's gender marker on your birth certificate if you were born in Illinois. Um, there has been a lot of litigation about what that term means. It's not defined in the statute, right? And remember I said there's a lot of different types of surgeries someone might have. 
um, to change our gender markers. So are we talking about a facial feminization surgery? Are we talking about breast augmentation, breast reduction, mastectomy? Are we talking about hysterectomy? Are we talking about genital surgeries? The statute is, is very vague. Um, so we have a bunch of litigation about this issue. Um, and if you, if you read the statute in conjunction with the N. Ray Simmons case, that marriage case from 2005, you'll see that they are very much related to one another because the reason he thought his marriage was valid is because he had had a surgery and had changed his gender marker on his birth certificate and thought that he was legally considered male. Um, so there is a dance that happens between particularly that administration. Um, the non-surgical requirements, these are all fairly new. Um, most of these agencies did require surgeries previously. Um, but the Illinois State ID card requires a letter from a medical provider, um, a social security gender marker change, which is very important if you're going to be employed to have your gender marker match your identity documents. It's also important if you're signing up on the, the exchange for the ACA. You will not be able to sign up for the exchange if your gender marker is not the gender marker in the Social Security Administration's database when you sign up online. Um, to do that, there's a bunch of different ways you can do it, but the final one is a medical certification from a medical doctor that says you've had appropriate clinical treatment for gender transition. It does not require surgery, it does not require hormones. Um, and the same for a U.S. passport. So I like to call this bureaucracy roulette. <laughs> um, it's clearly a game that we play as trans people with changing our gender markers. And there can be a lot of reasons why someone doesn't change their gender marker or someone who wants to change their gender marker might not be able to, like in the example of the Illinois birth certificate because they haven't had the type of surgery that's required by the statute for the administration to change um, their gender marker. It's very common for trans people to have ident identity documents that say different things about their genders, which of course is another thing that opens trans people up to surveillance and suspicion, right? Having different identity documents is usually not, usually not a good idea. Um, but sometimes it is unavoidable for us. So as an advocate, understanding that, understanding that someone might have different identity documents that say different things about their name or gender marker, um, and certainly not kind of contributing to that surveillance type of mentality around why that might be, can be an excellent thing to show a trans person that you are trans knowledgeable um, and uh, trans friendly, friendly as an advocate. Okay, the only other thing I want to say before Q&A, which we have a very short amount of time for, is that there are some big sweeping policy changes that have happened in the last four years here in Illinois and Cook County and Chicago. Um, and those are all specific to uh, criminalization issues. So in 2011, the Cook County uh, Sheriff's Department introduced a new directive specific to transgender detainees in Cook County Jail, which of course is um, the largest per capita jail unit in the United States. We have a huge jail here in Cook County. So I inc included that in your CLE materials to read. We also have a Chicago Police Department policy which came out in 2012 about the search, arrest, and detention of transgender people. Um, and this is where we see that can reason there can be no reasonable suspicion that someone is engaged in prostitution just because they're transgender. That language comes from there, but it also directs the police department how to refer to a transgender person, where a transgender person should be housed, which is central detention at 17th and State in Chicago. Um, so they're not gonna be housed with men or women, but in a isolated unit of trans people. Um, and who should search that person? The gender of the officer that should search that person. And then finally, the Illinois Department of Corrections has released a revised directive. They did have a directive as long back as 2003 about transgender detainees, but 2013, um, May of 2013 marked a new directive that completely replaces the old directive that establishes a gender identity committee um, which is what the Sheriff's Department did as well, which is a committee of people who decide where it will be safe for someone to be housed, what types of medical care can that person have, can they get back on their hormones, their feminizing hormones, even though they're in a men's facility, can they have access to a bra, even though they're in a men's facility where that would otherwise be contraband, right? Some, some questions like that are determined by a committee, so I included all of those so you can look at them. We're actually moving very quickly as far as states go, as state correctional departments go, with changing policies and addressing this um, legal issue for trans people. Okay, 
Um, I have so many more things to say, but an hour is not enough time to say them all. So um, we have a few minutes for question and answer. If anybody who's online or in the room has any questions about anything I've said, legal issues I've brought up, advocacy questions, questions about um, transgender people, surgery questions, anything like that, this is an open time to ask them. I have a question yeah. with pronouns from cis to trans. Yeah. How do you speak about people that are in the middle? I don't know. How okay. do you, what pronouns mm -hmm. when you're in court yeah. or drift? Yeah. yeah. That's a great question. I actually. Oh, Can I repeat the question? I will repeat the question. The question is um, what pronouns do you use for someone who is transitioning from a cisgender to a transgender in that process, in the transition process, in court, et cetera? Actually, I was asking how do you identify people that are not that are transitioning from cis to neither I see to neither yes do you have that okay um, so what I do and I included a sample motion in the materials I do what's called a gender motion I totally came up with this on my own there's really you can't find it in the West practice series <laughs> um, but someday I hope you can um, so what I do is I make a motion to the court asking the court to use my client's preferred pronouns. Usually this is in criminal court, um, and so I also ask the court to direct the state to do the same thing. If that person's pronouns are gender neutral, non-gendered, maybe they just use their name, maybe they use gender neutral pronouns like they and them, which is grammatically incorrect but gender affirming for that person, um, I will ask the court to use those pronouns. I've never had my motion denied. Um, and I think, you know, it's just basic respect. Um, there's no legal significance to using someone's gender marker, right? Um, it's just really respect for that person. Um, and and I, I, in the few moments where the state has not wa elected to use someone's preferred um, name or pronoun, it's usually made the state look pretty aggressive and helped their case very much. <laughs> so I think it's just good for everyone to be on board with this um, and get to the actual issue in the case. So that's what I do. Any other questions? I guess two questions. Um, courts tend to be pretty deferential to you because I'm guessing they're not terribly well educated in a lot of these areas. And is that an advantage or a disadvantage to you to have that, that ignorance in court mm -hmm. as an advocate? And I guess the second is how are these issues related to children whose gender identity may be more in flux and less willing to defer to what they are saying about themselves. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, I definitely feel that for the most part, um, we can use the ignorance. Ignorance feels like such a harsh word, but <laughs> um, the naivete, the lack of experience with these issues to our advantage, certainly. It's definitely an educational opportunity. Um, it's something that we can use in mitigation, even if we lose. Um, I found that really helpful in sentencing to explain to the court, this person is going to be placed in a men's facility if we, if we lock them up, right? And there's a whole bunch of legal issues that will happen because of that. There's safety, right? It's going to be a, kind of an extra level of punishment to have your gender identity denied um, on top of being incarcerated, for example. Um, or explain some of those systemic barriers, right? Why this person might not have connection to their family, why they might not have a job. It's not because they're, they're fitting into this kind of like lazy poor person stereotype, right? But they've been working really hard and um, they actually haven't been able to change these things about their gender marker which has made it hard for them to get employment, right? Even if we lose those arguments, which we often do, right? Um, it's still a moment where we've educated the court, we've educated opposing counsel, our client feels advocated for in a whole new way, which is a win in and of itself, right? So yes, absolutely. Um, I also, the other question, I realize I didn't say the question. <laughs> the other question is how does this relate to children, particularly children who might um, be gender non-conforming, right? And um, maybe have less autonomy over making decisions about what they want to do with their health care. Um, so this is a big issue, and it comes up particularly in that best interest of the child analysis. It can come up in, you know, kind of nasty divorce cases with custody battles. It comes up in the name change issue. It can come up in access to medical care. Um, it comes up a lot in DCFS, wards of the state, um, and how those young people are going to be treated while they'll be placed um, if they're in a group home. And, um, there's kind of developing schools of thought about decisions for themselves. Um, and 
For example, Laurie Children's Hospital has a gender and sexuality center that's run by Dr. Travis Gales, Dr. Rob Garofalo, who are really pushing the idea of using um, hormone blockers for young people so that they do not have a puberty either way as they're coming of age and making that decision for themselves. Because part of the problem with transition is that you're also counteracting another puberty that's happened, right? So for a transgender woman, um, if that person is maybe 12 or 13 and is on an, a hormone blocker, she will never develop facial hair. She will never have that lowered voice, which is an elongation of the vocal cord that doesn't go back when you start taking estrogen. This is why trans women need to sometimes train their voices to sound higher so that um, they can be read as women, right? Have their identities uh, recognized. So using that hormone blocker is a great idea, right? Okay, let's, let's pause, right? Not make a decision one way or the other, certainly not address things like surgeries, but maybe we have less need for surgeries, breasts haven't developed, et cetera, yet, um, and allow that person to be old enough to make the decision for themselves. This is a very radical idea. Um, it's getting some attention in places like, you know, Dr. Phil and like the Oprah network of like, ooh, like what's happening with these trans people? I feel like Oprah is really into trans people. I don't know why. Um, but it's great, right? Because Oprah is huge and people then are more educated about the issue. Um, so that's one idea. Um, I've found in the name change process, the young person's interest plays a huge role in judges um, decision making around changing someone's name. Um, and hearing about the way that they might be harassed in school, hearing about issues they're having with their family, et cetera, is actually very compelling for the court, I've found. Um, doesn't totally answer your question, but those are some ideas. Well, and with that, we've uh, run out of time, so hopefully Owen can hang around for a little bit and answer some more questions for those who are here. But thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah.